Search the area. Stay sharp. This way. Over here. This horror was everywhere I went, circling me. The cops didn't stand a chance. They were after a writer, not a monster. I could see the lights at the radio station in the distance. Imagine that the broadcast tower in the distance was part of the local radio station. Maine seemed like a decent guy. Perhaps he could give me directions to the coal mine. Unnatural shadows clung to the gate. The darkness that was after me was trying to stop me. I wouldn't get through without it. There was no power to the searchlight. Thank you. 
old generator conked out, I'd have to see if I could fix it and try again. It took me a moment to recognize the flashbang grenades. They were an ideal weapon for my situation. KBFFM with Pat Main. It's Milt Peabody, Pat. What's on your mind, Milt? Well, I live near the trailer park, Pat, and there's a big ruckus going on over there. Well, that's just up the road from me, too. Uh, what's going on, do you know? I don't know, but there's a bunch of police cars there, lots of sirens, a helicopter buzzing around, and I think I heard some gunshots. Gunshots? Yes, sir, like from a pistol. So can you find out what's going on? Because it's just next door and they're popping off guns there. They're still shooting? No, it was maybe 10, 15 minutes ago. It sounds serious, Pat. I'm telling you, it don't sound like no party. Well, I'm, I'm certainly going to give the station a call, Milt. Okay. You'll hear it here as soon as I hear from them. Okay, thanks.
hope Maine could lend me a car to get to the coal mine. in, Mr. Wake. Oh, I'm so glad you could find the time to do this, Mr. Wake. No way to run now, Sam Brown. You back away from me. Don't hurt. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Everyone calm down. Put the gun down. We're all friends here, right? Cool your jets, Nightingale. We got him. What the hell's the matter with you? There's a civilian in there. I had fallen off so many cliffs it was ridiculous. That's what you get for naming a book the sudden stop. It was probably good I hadn't had the chance to tell Maine where I was going. I'd have to lose the cops and find my own way to the mine. Nightingale stared through the broken studio window into the dark woods. He turned around, started to walk out, but Maine grabbed his arm. Young man, you almost shot me. You don't shoot off rounds at people like that. What's the matter with you? Nightingale shook his arm free, marched out. His cheeks burned with rage and humiliation.
Danny had stepped out, but what stumbled back in was something else. Something alien. A monster. Walter tried to kill it, first with his fists, then a chair. It wouldn't die. Instead, it kept coming, unaffected by the beating it had taken. After Walter managed to kick it down the cellar stairs, fear took over. He ran, got behind the wheel, gunned the engine. The booze wouldn't make him forget, but he knew he had to try. sensible reason for the power company work lights to be here. It was almost as if they'd been left for someone like me to use.
The bulldozer's engine roared to life. Mud and rocks flew as it fought for traction. It crashed the concrete wall and landed heavily in the yard. If it were an animal, it would have shaken its head after the impact, fixed its eyes on me, and charged. Of course, it had no head, nor eyes. Shadows crawled on its form, twisting it into a monster. Then, it came for me. Sarah trusted her gut, and her gut said Agent Nightingale was an asshole. He felt wrong, and it wasn't just the smell of stale booze. It was in the way he flashed his badge, pulled rank, the look in his eyes when he wanted answers. Where was Alan Wake? What was this about an accident? Where was his wife? And most importantly, why did she let Wake go? He wouldn't answer her questions. Federal business was all he'd say. Hello? The most stubborn man I've ever met. Alice? Alice? Alan. Alan. I'm so afraid. It keeps me in the dark. Please help me. I look at you, Alan, and it's not you. It's something else. Looking out from behind your eyes. Alice, I'm here. I'm so alone here. It's all gonna go to hell. Cooperate. The connection had been terrible, but that wasn't the only thing that hadn't been right with the call. She sounded wrong somehow, but she had called me. The pipe wrenched itself loose from the bridge's steel framework. Wrapped in darkness, it floated in midair, twitching. For a moment, I didn't understand what I was looking at. The heavy object lurched at me with impossible force. I threw myself out of the way, but just barely. When I turned my flashlight on it, it shook in a dark rage before it flew at me again. I could see a railway bridge up ahead, and a warehouse of some sort on the opposite shore. I hoped I could find a car from there.
Tsurimi was growing stronger, and it was taking over everything in its path. Sure. I hoped I could find a car from there. that was pursuing me was growing stronger, and it was taking over everything in its life. I slammed the door shut right in his smug face. He pleaded for me to open the door. True to form, the asshole actually thought I would obey. I had no sympathy left, no guilt either, not for him. I took a moment to savor the scream. I bet I had a smile on my face. It was all that I had time for. The dark presence was inside the lodge with me. As a teenager, just started to get interested in writing. Stephen King had been a source of inspiration to me. I thought about all the inanimate objects that had come to life in his books. No one is safe in a good horror story, certainly not the protagonist. That's what makes them fun. This was anything but. The darkness could possess anything, and it was getting closer.
take the facts of our existence for granted, unaware that they are merely a thin veneer of desperate self-delusion covering a vast cosmos of madness and horror. All too often, the stars are right in Night Springs. Tonight's episode, A Family Occasion. Journalist Alvin Durlis' trip to study the local customs of an insular community in Night Springs has been less than successful until tonight. Well, I'm glad you changed your minds about this. Ancient customs, local mythology. My editor loves this kind of stuff. Well, Mr. Durlis, we don't want to feel like we're on exhibition. But you have demonstrated the seriousness of your intent. Oh, I am serious. Really, just do your thing. I'll stay out of your way and observe. Actually, I thought you could assist us. I'm afraid we are a man short. It would provide you with an intimate perspective. Could I really? Of course, Mr. Durland. Well, I guess that's the least I... What would I have to do? Oh, here. Let me show you with a kiss. I, um, I... Mm. 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 darkness surged towards me, sucking everything loose from the ground into its depths, tugging at my clothes. I saw the flare the kidnapper had dropped and threw myself towards it just as I felt my feet leave the ground. The darkness embraced me with the force of a tornado. Somehow I managed to light the flare. The darkness roared and cast me away. I fell toward the dark waters of the lake far below.
never been this glad to see the sunrise. I had a couple of hours to get to the coal mine. The coal mine wasn't far now. Today, I would meet the kidnapper, and he would give me Alice. I wouldn't give him any other choice. A drowning man will clutch at a straw. I'd come to believe that the story in the manuscript was coming true. The current of its narrative had taken me deeper and deeper into dark waters. Alice had been taken from me. Barry was probably in jail. I was a fugitive from the FBI. The whole world taken over by the dark presence was trying to destroy me. It all felt real, but it matched a textbook case of insanity. FM. Folks, I want to apologize for kind of abandoning you to that looping music track last night, but I was detained. You see, I encountered a big shot G-man with an itchy trigger finger who could use a, a lesson in manners and a boot in the ass. Not necessarily in that order either. Now, folks, I know I'm not being very informative here, and I apologize for that. I really should just keep quiet, but I'm just so peeved right now because some people just shouldn't be carrying badges. I'm just glad that our Sheriff Breaker was there to straighten things out. And if someone I met last night is listening, let me just say, I'm sorry if my mouth got you in trouble. I'm pretty sure you're not the bad guy here. Godspeed, son. I hope you know what you're doing. Now, on a lighter note, I'll be talking to Dr. Nelson all morning. But first, a little music. Welcome back to KBF FM. Hope you enjoyed that tune. Now, Doc, you were talking about life and finding that special someone, that 
soulmate. Well, you were talking about that. I was saying I don't buy it. Well, see, to me, that's strange, because I always pegged you as a hopeless romantic. <laughs> you got me there, Pat. But I think love's where you look for it. And you need to do a lot of looking, sure. But the idea that there's that one special person out there for you, and if you miss that chance, it's gone forever and you're forever incomplete. I mean, isn't that depressing? Or, heck, childish even? Hey, there's plenty of fish in the sea. <laughs> and apparently a fisherman has a fishing analogy for everything, but what you're saying, isn't that a little harsh? Well, no. What I am saying is that your potential for finding that connection isn't limited to what's essentially a chance encounter. How is that harsh? Yeah, well, I guess that's a nice thought, but let me say something personal here. Okay. Now, well, I, I don't disagree with you exactly, but I can't really fit that together with what I feel, what I, what I felt for someone, because she was the one. She was. And she... I let her drift away from me. Maybe I didn't put in the work, I don't know, but, well, since then, and it, it was a long time ago, but, but since then, there hasn't been anyone, not like her. And I'm not saying I dwell on her or haven't moved on. I like my life. I, I'm not living in the past, but I do miss the way she completed me. You can't argue with the heart, Pat. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. I had kind of a scary experience last night, and let's just say it's shaken a few things loose. For Mott, spying on the writer on the ferry had been a disappointment. His boss had made Wake Out to be something special, but Mott hadn't been impressed. He'd gotten a good long look up the wife, though, and he liked what he saw. Mott had fantasized about goading Wake into a fight, but it hadn't happened. Still, he'd get his chance to see if the writer had anything in him. He'd been promised as much. early. I was supposed to meet the kidnapper at noon in the main building. The coal mine was quiet. It was a museum now. Thank you. 
With Nightingale gone and the night wind blowing in through the broken studio window, Maine stared at Sarah. The sheriff looked away. Maine's voice shook with barely controlled anger. That boy's doing more drinking than thinking. I hope you know what you're doing, Sarah. He's got a sickness in his eyes. You take my word for it. He wants Wake for a reason, and it's not for anything good. I didn't want to go outside. The cops had to be looking for me. The noon sun turned the place into a sauna. The day dragged on. Different scenarios ran through my mind. Ways of how I'd torture the kidnapper to get Alice back, or the different horrible things he could have done to her. I imagined her dead. I had no way of knowing she was still alive. It was killing me. I was running on blind hope. It was all a waste of time. The bastard never showed up. Wake! Where the hell are you? Change of plans. You know where Mirror Peak is? It's a big mountain north of where you are. You follow the path from the mine, you can't miss it. There's a lookout point there. I'll be waiting. I'm through being jerked around you by you. You want to see your wife alive? Because if you do, you better watch what you say to me. Do we understand each other? I want to talk to Alice. Yeah, and I want the manuscript. Don't keep me waiting, Wake. Hello? Hello! Ah! I'm gonna kill him! I had to get to Mirror Peak. Maybe closer than ever before. When Thomas Zane fell for Barbara Jagger, it happened fast. She was young, vibrant and beautiful, full of life. He had never been a very happy man, and without any seeming effort, she had changed all that. Zane felt good for the first time in his life. Everything she did was another piece of a jigsaw puzzle he hadn't even known he'd been missing. And best of all, she made the words flow, strong and sharp. She was his muse.
When Thomas Zane fell for Bond. The only way to reach the hillside ahead was to go through the building. I had to find a way to avoid electrocution. 